Heavenly Father, we're back again to study our word together. And today we have this very difficult but very important subject of death. What actually happens when one dies? And we need light, we need clarity, and we want to find that light in your word. What does the Bible say? And the Bible only. Help us. Please, dear Lord, help us so that we may not be deceived. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Five minutes after death. Welcome, dear friends. Have you ever thought about it? What happens when you die? Is it heaven? Or is it hell? Or is it nothing? What does the Bible say? Does the Bible say anything? I think it's a very important question because today so many books have been written, published on this subject. A string of books hit the bookshelves in recent times and we as Christians should take note and we should have an answer, a biblical answer. There's a few books I could lay my hand on. The most important perhaps this one from a prominent charismatic leader in South Africa, which became a bestseller of all times for any theological publication. Five minutes before and after death. The author first published five minutes after death and after that it was so popular, he also wrote a book on five minutes before death and now the two books are combined in one issue. There is a book, One Minute After You Die. Uh, what happens after death? Heaven and the afterlife. And so we can keep on. Life after death, heaven and hell. There was a, a book... Heaven is Real, written by Chu Thomas. Now, this was widely read, widely published, bestseller worldwide. And in this book, Heaven is Real, Chu Thomas states, God took me to heaven on 17 different occasions. Two times he showed me the hell and the things that are going to take place in the great tribulation after he had taken his children to heaven. In the end, he also showed me the rapture. Now, what do we as, as Christians do with all of this? All these different opinions on death. And then, to make it even more difficult, people like John Edward comes on stage on TV in a program crossing over which was also shown here in South Africa. Now, John Edward, an internationally acclaimed psychic medium who can communicate with the world beyond is what it says there crossing over. Now, what he did on television was that he had an audience and then he would ask somebody whether that person would like to have some kind of communication with a loved one that has already died. And then he has 
John Edward would communicate with the, the deceased. And this is now live. And then he would bring back a message from the deceased to the loved one that is sitting in the audience. Now, the strange thing was that more than once, when John Edward did that, he brought a message to this beloved one from the deceased that was something that was only known by the deceased and the loved one. Nobody else knew about that. So the question arises, is John Edwards communicating with the other side? And the answer is, yes. Yes, he is. Is John Edwards communicating with the dead? The answer is no. Definitely not. But he is communicating with the other side. Now, how can we be so sure of what has just been said? The question again. When you die, is it heaven? Is it hell? Is it nothing? What does the Bible say? Now we've said to each other, that's our only haven. While we study. The Bible, the Bible only. Has the Bible got an answer? Has Jesus got an answer? Can he answer the question for us? Well, let's listen. Let's listen to Jesus himself. Revelation 1.17 Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forever. And have the keys of hell and of death. Who has the keys of hell and death? Jesus has. That's what he says. Can we trust him? Well, if we cannot trust him, who can we trust? Let, let him give us the answers that we're looking for. Now, to understand this topic, we actually need to go back to the beginning. We need to go back to creation. If we need to establish, establish what man really is, before we continue. Let's read Genesis 2 verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man received a living soul. Is that, is that what the Bible says? Man received a living soul? Read again. Breathed into his nostrils, nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now, is there a difference between received and became? Yes. A very big difference. What is man then? God created him from dust, but that was not yet man. That was only a body. It, it was only when God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life that man became a living soul. One can thus make a sum of it. Body, add breath to the body, it becomes a living soul, a living being, a living body. For death, you could reverse it. The living soul, take away the breath, what 
is left. A lifeless body. The Hebrew word for soul is the word nefesh. Nefesh. In other words, the body became a nefesh. But now listen to this verse, Genesis 1, 3, 30. And to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth wherein there is life. And then the word nefesh, the Hebrew word nefesh is used there as well. Wherein there is a nefesh. The same word used for the beast of the earth, even the birds, the same word that's used for describing man. It describes a living creature. If you go back to the word nefesh, you will find out it's used 745 times in Hebrew. 473 times it's translated as soul. 120 times it's translated with life. 30 times just to point to the person itself, 15 times as heart, 9 times as being, a living being. The point here, not once, not once out of four, 745 times used as something that man has received as an entity which can operate outside of the body or as an entity over and above the body, not once. I am a living soul. You are a living soul. The soul is what you are, not something that you receive apart from the body. Man became a living soul. That's what the Bible says. Now, if that's true, what happens when one dies? Let's start turning to the Bible. Ecclesiastes 12.7 then shall the dust return to earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return to God who gave it. The word Spirit is, in, is another Hebrew word, namely the word Ruach. Ruach. And again it means actually the same thing. Ruach meaning breath, Spirit, wind, or breath of life. In other words, at, at death, the table is turned around. The body goes to the earth. The breath of life returns to God. That gave it. So, what returns to God? The ruach, the breath of life. Now, in the Greek you've got the word pneuma to describe the same thing. And again, it also only means wind, breath, life. So when Stephen calls out, Jesus, receive my spirit, the word pneuma is used there in the Greek. And he's actually saying, receive my breath of life. Receive my life. Now, where does the soul or the spirit then go when one dies? Because the Bible says the breath of life returns to God, uh, the body returns to the earth or the dust. What's left? What's left? It's like a bulb that it's switched on as long as it's connected, but the moment the connection is broken, it's dead got no light anymore. But now the logical question, if the body returns to the earth and the breath returns to God, where are the dead then? Now, dear friends, perhaps we should just ponder a moment here. 
For many hearing this subject for the first time now, or from another angle, this could really be a shock. It was to me. Actually a terrible shock. A mental shock, an emotional shock, an intellectual shock. even a physical shock. The reason being that most of us as Christians have been brought up in a certain culture with certain fixed and certain fixed ideas and certain fixed views regarding death and what happens after death and and any deviation from that view comes as a shock. Therefore, I think it's very important that we should ask, especially in this study, what does the Bible say and the Bible only? No other book. The Bible. Now, let's be guided by two rules. Let the Bible talk and explain itself. Let us not use any private interpretation. Secondly, let us go to the Bible unconditionally, without any preconditioned view. In other words, let's give the Bible chance to come to us new, as if as if we've never read it. Because you see, when you think that you know the Bible good enough, there's always the danger that we could read into the Bible instead of the Bible coming to us. For many years in my life, I had a certain view on this issue, a doctrinal view on this subject, and even as a minister of religion, I could easily take my doctrine on this subject and I could read it into the Bible. Today I know that if I had tested my doctrine with the Bible, it would not have stood the test. It would not have passed that test. And today you will see why. So let's go to the Bible with a blank sheet. We, we know nothing. Uh, we have no preconceived ideas. We're only going to ask the Bible to tell us what happens when one dies. So let's read the text in their context, because you can read any text out of its context, and then it can actually say, say whatever you would like it to say. Let's erect our split poles, if you wish, our fence. Let's put the one split pole here and the next one there and the next one there. Then you're going that side because if you start here, you're coming from another side and then you put the one here and the one and then you're going there. It all depends from from which side are you coming. So let's, let's begin. So far, We know now the body returns to earth and uh, the breath of life returns to God who gave it. Now the logical question, where are the dead? Well, Jesus tells us where they are. Let's listen to what Jesus says. And let's erect our first split bow. Marvel not at this, for the hour cometh in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. John 5, 28. Now, what next? And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of judgment. Jesus says, all they that are in their graves will rise. So, where are the dead according to Jesus? 
Well, in their graves. Now, immediately, this is not something that you've been taught or what you have believed um, until now. But remember now, we've agreed to start open-minded. According to Jesus, everyone are in their graves. And they will rise when they hear his voice when he comes again. But now the logical question, if they're, on, if they're in their graves, where, what are they doing there? Let's ask the Bible. Psalms 146 verse 3, 4. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help, his breath goes forth, he returns to his earth. In that very day, his thoughts perish. His breath goes forth. Where to? To God who gave it. His body returns to the earth. And that very day, his thoughts perish. Thus the question. When somebody dies, can he still, or she, can they still think? No, says the Bible. Their thoughts have perished. Now, that's not very difficult to understand. Now, let's turn to Psalms 115, 17. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. Now that's quite easy to understand. The dead does not praise God. So if a Christian dies, does he or she praise God? The Bible says no. The dead praise not the Lord. Now again, it's against that what you might have believed up until now. But remember we're planting in our pole. What, what has the Bible said up until now? Let's just recap. The body returns to the earth. The breath of life returns to God. On that day, his thoughts perish. The dead praise not the Lord because they cannot think anymore. They have no more thoughts. Let's turn to a, another text, perhaps even more clear. Ecclesiastes 9, 5. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Does the dead know anything? No, said the Bible, they know nothing. As a matter of fact, also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might, for there is no work, no, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave where you go. The Bible says when death sets in, there is no more works, no more wisdom, no more plans, no more thoughts, no more love, no more insight, no more praise to the Lord. So the logical question then is, in what state is man when he or she dies? Well, the safest haven, again, is, is our Lord and Savior Jesus. Let him answer this question. In Matthew 9, they come to him, while he spoke these things to them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead. But come and lay your hand on her, and she shall live. Now, listen to what Jesus says next. And you will see that all the gospel writers heard the same thing. He said to them, Give place, for the maid is not dead, but 
sleeps. And they laughed him to scorn. The basic translation says, he said, make room for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they were laughing at him. That was what Matthew heard. What did Mark hear? Well, the same thing. The child is not dead, but sleeping. And Luke, do not be sad, for she's not dead, but sleeping. When you turn to John 11, they come to Jesus and they tell them that Lazarus, his friend, has died. And then Jesus reacts in verse 11 and he says, Lazarus, our friend, is sleeping. But I go so that I may make him come out of his sleep. Now, listen to the reaction of the disciples. Listen to what they heard. The next verse. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. That's good news. If he's only sleeping, he's going to get well. And then the ver next verse, Jesus, in actual fact, sees that they did not understand him. For Jesus, however, was talking of his death. But they had the idea that he was talking about rest in sleep, the normal sleep. And then I can even see him calling them back and say, let's come and stand here. I need to tell you something. I need to tell, tell you boldly, clearly. Then Jesus said to them clearly, Lazarus is dead. Lazarus is asleep. Now, why, why did Jesus use this word sleep to describe the state of man after death? Well, let's think of it for a moment. If the body goes to the earth, the breath goes back to God, the dead are in their graves, they do not think anymore, they have no wisdom, no plans, no works, no knowledge. Well, think of it. Sleep might be the best word that one could use to describe that state of death. Death is a wonderful, deep, calm, unconscious state. That's what the original word in the Hebrew actually means. A deep, unconscious sleep. Jesus arrives at that tomb of Lazarus and he finds him in the tomb already. And then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. And he said, take you away the stone. Martha, his sister, the sister of him that was dead said to him, Lord, by this time he stinks, for he's been dead four days. Jesus stands in front of that grave, and what does he say? He cried with a loud voice, and he said, Lazarus, Lazarus, my friend, come forth. And the next moment, Lazarus comes out of the grave. Why, why did Jesus call him by his name? Why did he say, Lazarus, come forth? Why didn't he say, Lazarus, come down? Lazarus, come up? He calls him by his name. Lazarus, my friend, come out, come forth. If he had only said, come forth. You know what would have happened? All the graves would have opened. Because it's the creator of heaven and earth standing before that tomb. 
Lazarus, come out. And out comes Lazarus. What had Lazarus to say about heaven? He's been there now for four days, hasn't he? Or is there now something wrong with my brain? What had he to say about heaven? Nothing. Why not? Because he was not there. He slept in the grave and was called out of the grave by the voice of the giver of life. Here's the good news, dear friends. There is life after death. But that life comes at the second coming, at the resurrection, on the command of the voice of the life giver, Jesus Christ. A deep, unconscious, wonderful sleep. Think about it. Think about what we said previously. The moment you open your eyes, after that, Wonderful sleep. The moment you open your eyes, your Redeemer is in the clouds, calling you up to Him. And it will feel as if you've only had a night's wonderful sleep. It will feel as if you've slept for a few minutes. Actually, my brother and sister, there's something very special in this message in what the Bible teaches us about death. Satan has distorted the message with something, something with no sense and a lot of fear connected to it. There's nothing to fear, my brother, my sister. The truth will set you free and even prepare you for the day of your death without fear because you exactly know what God has installed for you. Very, very, very special. You will sleep, and the moment you open your eyes, your Redeemer is in the clouds. When last have you read Job? Job 14, Job himself asks the question. Verse 10, and, But man comes to his death and is gone. He gives up his spirit, and where, where is he? He asks the question. And then he answers the question in verse 12. So man lies down and rises not till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake, not be raised out of their sleep. So Job knew it. Did you know that Daniel also knew it? Daniel 12, the second verse. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. So Daniel knew it. David knew it. Psalm 17, 15. As for me, I will behold your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with your likeness. Even Martha knew it. Jesus said to her, your brother shall rise again. Listen to what Martha says to him. Martha said to him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection of the last day. And Jesus himself said it. Three times in one chapter, in chapter 6 of John, we read the same phrase. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 44, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 54, Whosoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I shall raise him up at the last day. Let's go back to John 14, where we've been already. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now tell me, my dear friend, if I were to be with Jesus five minutes after I die, why must he come back to receive me or to fetch me? Why does he have to come back? It does not make any sense. Now, Paul tries to explain this to the Corinthians. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, from verse 51 onwards, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Listen to the word. Paul is using. He knew it. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in a twinkle of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? There's your answer, my dear friend, brother and sister. This is the biblical answer. We sleep in the grave till the last trumpet sounds. The trumpet sounds and we will be changed. Now we are corruptible, but we will become incorruptible and immortal. When? When? When Jesus comes again. That is the promise of the Bible. We are now mortal, but we will become immortal. With death having no power over us anymore. What a promise. But let's just move to another funeral text. One of those that also troubled me in the beginning. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 But I would not have you to be ignorant, brothers, concerning them which are asleep. Again, Paul uses that word. Them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Now, I've conducted many funerals in my life. At the grave, there's a, there's a difference between the believer and the non-believer. Non it's quite apparent. The believers are in sorrow, yes. At times, they're broken. Their hearts are broken. You can see it. Uh, but in contrast, the, the unbeliever, you can see a state of panic, fear, anguish, anxiety. Why? Because there's no hope. I've even seen some of them jumping into the grave, onto the coffin, because there's no hope of seeing this loved one again. And that's why Paul said that I don't want you to be ignorant, brothers, concerning them which are asleep that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord shall, pre shall not prevent them which are asleep. Now what does that mean? Let's go to a, a basic translation. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are still living at the coming of the Lord will not go before those who are sleeping. We will not go to heaven before them. They will not go before us. Why not? Why not? Listen. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then? Then we that are alive, that are left, shall together with them be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 
and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. Now, my brother and sister, tell me, is that is, is this the words which we comfort each other normally at the grave sites? I'm afraid not. There's other words we use. Comfort each other, comfort one another with these words. At the second coming, those who fell asleep in Jesus will rise again. And together with the living at that stage, together the two groups will meet the Savior in the clouds. That's what the Bible teaches. They're not going before us. We're not going before them. We are going together. We are going together. Here's the translation of the King James. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The original word uh, for uh, and so, and so, in actual fact means in this manner, not in another manner. In this manner, this is the way that we will be with Christ. So the trumpets will sound, the dead in Christ will rise, the living will be transformed. Together these two groups will meet their Savior in the clouds of heaven. And in this manner we will be with Christ. Comfort one another with these words. But I found so much comfort in believing that my beloved is with Jesus in heaven. Comfort one another with these words. If you know that the living knows that they will die and that the dead know nothing, you will never be deceived by John Edward or any psychic. A woman, and this is a true story, lost her daughter at the age of nine. Something stuck in her throat and she suffocated. And on returning from the funeral, the mother came down the corridor in, the, in their home and she saw her daughter coming running towards her calling out, Mommy, Mommy. Now, in her, in her testimony afterwards, this mother said that she had to grab every inch of strength and faith in her to stand still and say, You are not my daughter. Go away, Satan. And then that image disappeared. The living know, the dead know nothing. This is a grave. Family is preparing it with a coffin lying on the bed. And even everything this person will need in the grave. Strange, eh? One of the most powerful deceptions in the end, my brother and sister, will be spiritism. Communicating with the dead. Messages from the grave. We must, be aware, we must be aware of it. Many such manifestations will take place in the last days. It has already begun. The safest place to be is with the Word of God. That's what makes sense. As an example, do you, do you believe that every person belonging to the church will go to heaven? Or... Every churchgoer is a safe person. Well, I don't believe it. I don't believe that you go to heaven because you belong to a certain church. You will go to heaven only through and by accepting the blood of Jesus Christ as an atonement for your sin. And if I read the book of Re Revelation correctly, many in churches will not go to heaven. Have you ever been to a funeral where the minister said, Brothers and sisters, I'm so sorry to tell you today that John, yeah, is an actual fact at this moment burning in hell. Have you ever heard that? No. Why not? Why not? Because everyone is going to heaven. Nobody's go to, going to hell. Every Christian is going to heaven. And that, while the 
Bible clearly states that those who will be saved are few. Many will try to get in but won't. Something is radically wrong somewhere in the teachings of the churches today. In any case, no one knows the heart of someone else. How can you, in actual fact, state that she's in heaven, or he's in heaven, or in hell? For that matter, isn't it just safer to say what the Bible says? Brother John is sleeping in his grave until the giver of life calls him out of there. What about that man and woman that dies together in an accident? She goes to heaven and he goes to hell. Or uh, perhaps, perhaps he goes to heaven and she goes to hell. But let's for a moment assume she goes to heaven and he goes to hell. Now, what joy could it possibly be for her knowing that her, hus her husband is burning in hell here next to her? And then she looks down on the earth and she sees her children fighting over the, in the inheritance. Who's getting the car? Who's getting the money? Who's getting the house? Well, there she sees her ch children suffering. There her son gets a heart attack. Her grandchild is in a terrible accident. Her daughter is sitting in a wheelchair. Her other daughter is losing her baby. Could, could that be heaven, my dear friend? Could that be the peace and happiness that God has installed for us? Never. Of course not. Is it, is it not better to believe what the Bible tells us? The dead know nothing. They're asleep in their graves till they hear the voice of the giver of life. Now, someone might now say, wait a minute, wait a minute, what about that thief on the cross? Did Jesus not say to him that he would be with him in heaven that day? Well, we don't want to miss anything, so let's go there. What does it say? Is it not exactly that? We know the history. Let's read Luke 23, verse 42. And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The one mocked him, the other one said, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And then Jesus answers him and he says, and Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, today shall you be with me in paradise. So there it is. Jesus telling this man, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, some might know it, some might not. The original Greek had no punctuations, no commas, no dots, no chapters or headings did not exist. Those were put in many centuries later, after the, after the Reformation, by the translators of the Bible. Now, how do we know that? Well, we know that because Jesus did not go to heaven on that day. Now, how do we know that? Well, the Bible tells us that. Let's read in the Gospel of John, we read about Mary Magdalene standing at the grave, crying, Sunday morning. The grave is empty. And suddenly Jesus appears, and, and she's so glad to see him, she recognizes him, she runs to him, and she wants to embrace him. What does he say to her when she approaches him? Jesus said to her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. I am not yet ascended to my Father. When was that? Sunday morning. So it's quite clear. He, it cannot be that Jesus told that man on Friday afternoon that he would be in heaven with him that day. So what happened here? Well, it's quite simple. The translators of the Bible put the comma in this sentence where they thought the comma should be. From their perspective believing in a doctrine of the dead going to heaven immediately. But let's put the comma on the place where it should be. 
and then let's read it again. Suddenly it will make sense to you. Let's read the old translation first. And Jesus said to him, Truly, I say to you, comma, Today shall you be with me in paradise. Now let's shift this comma one word. And Jesus said to him, Truly, I say to you today, comma, You shall be with me in paradise. Today, yeah, we, yeah, we, we are today. Me and you hanging on this cross. This day, I'm telling you, you will be with me in paradise. Now, I think we should start concluding, but we cannot do so without looking at the rich man and Lazarus. Because that book I referred to at the beginning, five minutes after death, after you die, mainly uses the rich man and Lazarus in the Bible to make its point. Now the first question we need to ask here is, was this a real event as that publication five minutes before and after death states or, or is this in actual fact a parable? Is it a parable or is it a real event? It makes a vast difference. Well, let's try and establish Matthew 13, 10, And the disciples came and said to him, Why speak you to them in parables? And then Jesus answers, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they, seeing, see not, and hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. And then in verse 34, uh, it states it. All these things spoke Jesus to the multitude in parables. And without a parable spoke he not to them. So, the Bible is quite clear. This was a parable. The rich man and Lazarus. Now, what is a parable? Well, a parable is a story. It's fiction. A story, you want to illustrate something else, an actual fact. Uh, you want to convey a message, a certain message, and then you, by doing, by telling the story, and applying that story to the message, you get the message across. And in actual fact, Jesus was only confronting the theology of some of the Pharisees when he was telling the story, because that is what they also believed, of a soul, that an entity that can operate outside the body. And which leaves the body a death. Now, let's read this parable. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into, the, into Abram's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Now, note that the beggar did not go to heaven. He was carried to Abram's bosom. It says the rich man also died and was buried and in hell. He lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and sees Abram afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And then he, he cried out and he said, Father Abram, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip his, the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now some people tend to say that what Jesus is saying here is that good people immediately go to heaven and bad people immediately go to hell. But you know, this creates more problems than answers. The moment you take this parable as literal. Think about it. Think about it. They are so, they are so near to each other that they can communicate with one another. Uh, can it be really so nice to communicate with those 
being tormented and burning in hellfire here next to you. Could that be heaven? But it, but it becomes worse. Listen. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Now, that is quite near. That is an arm's length. between heaven and hell. And then you hear that they are fingers and tongues. But I thought that people say that the soul goes to heaven. I've never heard anybody say that your body also goes to heaven. Now your soul goes to heaven and then eventually your soul will come back to your body in the grave. But you see, there's a deception here. A deception of Satan. Listen carefully. Did you, did you see this one? If you die, and your breath, your soul goes to heaven, and your body goes to heaven, tell me, what then dies? Nothing. And then, John Edward is right. But now, this deception is even more serious than that. Here's the deception of Satan. Listen very carefully. If nothing dies, my dear friend, if nothing dies, then Jesus did not die even. So Jesus also did not die. And if, if he did not die, then I am lost. That's the deception. But you see, Jesus did die. He rested in the grave. He rose from the grave. He ascended to heaven. And that's why you and I can have everlasting life. So what was it that Jesus was wanted to convey to his listeners. Let's read on. Let's read on. But Abram said, Son, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and likewise Lazarus even evil things. But now he's con comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass through Hence, to you cannot, and neither can they pass to us. That would come from there. What is Jesus saying here? He's actually confronting the false teachings of the Pharisees, which had a group teaching that the immortality of the soul was real. Actually, a heathen concept that came into the church. But what is Jesus actually saying here? He's actually saying the day you die, you are dead. You cannot be saved after that. It means nothing to give something to someone that's already died. It's over. He sleeps in the grave. If you want to give your life to God, do it now. Do it today. God does not want us to rely on miracles, but on His Word alone. And that is the message. And that's exactly what he's saying through this parable. Listen now. Let's read. It's the only parable that mentions a specific name of a person. There's no other par parable mentioning a specific person's name. But here it is, Lazarus. Now, let's read. Then he said, I pray you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that's now on earth, that he may testify to them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Listen to what Abram says to him. Abram said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Now, what is that? What does he say? He says, they have the Bible. 
Moses and the prophets was their Bible. That's all they had. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abram, but if one went to them from the dead, they will repent. If someone from the dead could go to them, they will repent. Now listen to the answer, my dear friend. And he said to him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Even if someone would come from the dead, that would not persuade them. And about two weeks after this parable, Jesus stands in front of the grave of a real man with the name of Lazarus. He rises him up from the dead. Did this miracle convince the Jews? Did they now believe? John eleven forty seven. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man does many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation. And listen to this. John 12, 9. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. That was the outcome. Did they convert? Did they believe? No. No. They wanted to kill Lazarus again. So the Jews gave a literal demonstration of the fact that a miracle was not necessarily going to convert people. If people do not accept the word of God, if they do not accept what's in this book, they will not be convinced even when someone is brought from the grave in front of their eyes. Where did all this all begin, my dear friends? Right at the beginning. Let's go back. Genesis 3, 3. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God had said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. What's the devil's answer to Eve? You shall not surely die. You will not die. These words with the first sermon on the teaching of the immortality of the soul. While the Bible states the opposite. The Bible says, the soul that sins, it shall die. Ezekiel 18.20 And the only one with immortality is the King of kings and the Lord of lords who only as immortality. Now, dear friends, nobody wants to die. But Jesus says that when you die, you fall asleep in him. It will be like a wonderful night. The moment you open your eyes, your Savior will be in the clouds. Now, when will Jesus come for you as an individual? Well, we don't know. But think of it. The day you die... He has actually already come for you. Because the moment you open your eyes, he's in the clouds. Jesus is in Gethsemane, he's in prayer, and even he says, Father, if there's any other way, please let it pass me. He did not want to go to that cross, but he did it for you and for me, in our place, in your place. He arrives at Golgotha, uh, they spit on him, they hit him, they torture him, and they mock him. I suppose they even kicked him. 
And that's all for you and for me. They spread his stretched body out on the cross. The nails are driven through his body. They lift that cross up and they throw it in that hole of a meter or a meter and a half deep. It's as if we are standing there all for you and for me. But dear friends, this is Friday. This is Friday evening. All hope has vanished from the disciples. A dark cloud hangs over their future. Where do, you, where do you think that Peter spent that night? What was the last words that Peter uttered? Well, it was the words, I, I know him not. In actual fact, the Bible states that the third time he said it, uh, Peter cursed and he said, I know not this man. Personally, I think Peter spent that night in Gethsemane there where Jesus was sweating blood. Sunday morning comes, the grave opens, the grave is empty. Peter decides that he is resigning. He's resigning as, as a disciple. He's going back. He says, who's going back with me? I'm going back fishing. I'm going back from where I come from. Who's coming with me? Not aware that he has risen, that he lives. What does Jesus tell the woman? He tells them, go and tell the other that I have risen and also go and tell Peter. He mentions his name. Do not forget to tell Peter. Yes, Peter, you did deny that you know me. Yes, Peter, you did do that three times in a row towards a harmless maid. Yes, Peter, the third time you did it, you sweared and you said you did not know me. But Peter, here I am. I have conquered death in your place, on your behalf. Peter, you are also forgiven. Come, Peter. The new Jerusalem is standing open also for you. Do not, do not forget to tell Peter. He's here, he's alive, and you and I are forgiven. Jesus lives.